there you go. And can I come down there? Will that be all right? Praise the Lord. Well, man, this is an honor for me to get to be here. I tell you, uh, I knew nothing about this association, but when I got the invitation, um, I just prayed about it and really felt like I was supposed to be here, and I really feel like I'm supposed to be here. And so I really appreciate the stand that you all have taken and uh, have continued on even during these uh, coronavirus things. You know, it's like... uh, The coronavirus is like the 500-pound gorilla in the room. and uh, But I'm sure that you've already been dealing with that. I've heard that you had somebody here who spoke about it. So I think we need a break from talking about the coronavirus, if you don't mind. Amen. And I would just like to share with you some things that God has done in my life. And none of this is to give me credit or anything. I mean, I've often said this, and this is something I say on a regular basis, that if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me because uh, I'm a college dropout. All I have is a high school education, and yet God has just blessed me and given me an opportunity to impact people, and so uh, everything I'm saying is just to glorify the Lord. You know, I was in Vietnam, and I was on a fire support base there, and there was one man who I really witnessed to a lot and tried to share the gospel with him, and he was just, uh, he was a mess. He actually had a rock that he had painted white and wrote God on it, and he had it up above his bunk, and that was his God. And he worshipped this rock. And one day, uh, people got tired of hearing him talk about all of this, and so they took the rock and threw it off the mountain. And he came out with an Uzi, and he was going to kill somebody. He says, Who took my God? And I thought it was just really good that one of the guys says, wasn't much of a God, was it, if you could throw it away? (laughs) And it just settled him down. But anyway, I witnessed to this man constantly, and, and he would ask me, so what has God done in your life? And I wouldn't tell him my testimony because I was embarrassed about it. Because, um, you know, I was just telling Jane this morning that I'm, I'll be turning 71 here in just a few days, and I have never had a drink of liquor, I've never smoked a cigarette, I've never said a word of profanity, I have never even tasted coffee in my nearly 71 years. I'm not against coffee, nothing wrong with coffee. You got a scripture to stand on for drinking coffee. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. So (laughs) it's, there's nothing wrong with coffee, but I'm just saying I live this secluded and separated life and I thought that this guy who was such a you know, a, a bad guy by the world standards, I thought he would make fun of me if he knew my testimony. So I gave him Nikki Cruz's testimony. I gave him everybody. I told him about everybody else. And finally, one day, he just backed me into a corner, and he says, I want to hear what God did for you. How did you get born again? And I told him, I said, I got saved when I was eight years old, the very first time that God ever really nailed me and convicted me over my sin And I told him, I said, I've never done any of these things. I said, I've been seeking God my whole life. And I was braced to see what his response would be. And to my surprise, this hardened man broke down and started crying. And he says, there's got to be a God. He says, for somebody to live in this day without having to go through all of this stuff, he says, that's the greatest testimony I'd ever heard. And it changed my opinion on things. I've got a man that works for me in my television department, and he, he uh, always, this is his saying, he says, everybody's got a story, and it's better than you think. And it's absolutely true. And he has helped us now to produce over 40 testimonies of people miraculously healed, raised from the dead, healed from multiple sclerosis, uh, just every kind of a miracle that you can imagine. And he takes people that think they don't have anything to share and just draws out of them this and I tell you God has a plan for every one of us and I don't know why but when I was a little kid I remember five and six years old at night I would just lay out in the backyard and ask God what was the purpose for my life what did he create me for and I had no clue I didn't get any great revelation but I mean I did this on a regular basis I'd look at the stars and just think there's got to be some purpose in my life And I remember my mother 
uh, asking what was going on. She thought something weird was happening because I don't guess this is the way most five or six year olds act. But I just always knew that God had a purpose for me and I want to say that this is not unique to me. God has a purpose for every single one of you. You know, I was just talking to one of our Bible college graduates, Elizabeth, and she's working in the convention industry and she said something about, uh, I think this is Elizabeth here, I can't see anything because of these lights. But, I, <laughs> but anyway, she was saying something about she thought she might be in full-time ministry, but she's working in the convention. And I said, man, we need that. We need godly people out in the marketplace doing all of these things. Everybody does not need to be behind the pulpit. And that's one of the reasons that we aren't making a bigger impact than we are is because people have just shut Jesus up into the, into the church. We need to be out in the marketplace. So he, he may have a different purpose for you than he has for me, but nobody just happened. Whether your parents knew you were coming or not, God had a plan in you, and God had a purpose for you from creation. I'm not going to take time. I could minister on this. Matter of fact, I happen to have about 10 hours worth of teaching on what I'm saying right here. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but Psalms 139 says, before you were formed in your mother's womb, before you were knit together and all of your bones put together, God had already written in his book what your whole life is supposed to be. Now, he doesn't force you to do that. He doesn't just sovereignly control you and make everything happen in your life. I really disagree with that teaching. But he does have a plan for you. And so I just knew from an early age that he had a plan for me. But then uh, I got born again when I was eight. And uh, I just, I didn't mean to do it, but I became a religious Pharisee. And I thought that I had to, do everything right and live holy in order for God to love me and to use me. And so I tried harder than anybody else. Um, I would lead more people per week to the Lord than the pastor of the church would. I led two and three people a week to the Lord. And I say to the Lord, I just would have them repeat a prayer after me. I don't know if they got saved or not. But I was, I was out there doing all of these things, trying to earn God's favor. And I was really excited about how holy I was. And uh, thought that I was better than, than other people. And I became a religious Pharisee. But my life really changed. I was born again when I was eight. And I mean, the day after I got saved, I went to school. And my friends at school could tell that something was different about me at eight years old. And they said, what happened to you? And I told them I got saved. And they made fun of me for being a Christian when I was eight years old. So it was genuine. But when I was uh, 18... In 1968, March the 23rd, next Monday night will be my 52nd anniversary of this. And um, I was in a prayer meeting, and this will show you how religious I was, because every Saturday night, uh, me and my best friends would get together, and we'd pray from 10 o'clock until midnight every Saturday night and pray for revival and do things. And it's a long story, but I came in, and I was just sitting down and talking to my friends, and we were shooting the breeze, and our youth director, he just fell on his face and got to praying. And I mean, he was talking directly to God. When he prayed, it wasn't like my prayers. They weren't just religious prayers. He was talking to God, and he would stop in the middle of his prayer, and sometimes the Lord would talk back to him. That never happened to me. So I enjoyed listening to this man pray, but once he prayed, uh, there was nothing left for me to say. And so I'd always come in and I'd pray first and get my little prayer out of the way so that I could enjoy him praying because it made me look bad. And this night, he just fell on the floor and got to praying before I had a chance to pray. And instead of me you know, rejoicing with him or listening to him, all I was thinking about is, I'm going to look bad. What are people going to think about me? And I got mad at this guy. And I was thinking terrible, terrible thoughts. And I don't even know all of the reasons why this happened. But it's like God pulled back a curtain. And for the first time in my life, I mean, I saw my religious uh, hypocrisy and stuff from God's standpoint. And I rec recognize, like it says in Isaiah, that all of your 
righteousness is like filthy rags. And I saw that I, you know, I believe that self-righteousness is worse than homosexuality, worse than murder, adultery, than anything else. I believe that trusting in your own goodness is the worst sin that could possibly happen. You know, Jesus forgave the sinners, the publicans, the prostitutes. He would eat with those people. But the people that he rebuked were the religious people. In Matthew chapter 23, he says, you're, you're whited sepulchers, you're full of dead man's bones. The only people that Jesus ever rebuked were religious people who were trusting in their own goodness. And that's what I had become. I didn't mean to do it, but it happened. And I saw this. And for the, all of a sudden, I just saw myself from God's standpoint that I was uh, a hypocrite and I was trusting in my own goodness. And uh, there's a lot of things that go into this. I wish I had time to tell you everything. But I was an introvert. I could barely look at a person and talk to them. I, I remember walking down the street in high school and a man saying, Good morning. And he was two blocks down the street before I could say good morning. I was sitting in my car and finally said good morning after he'd gone two blocks. I was an introvert. But all of a sudden, when I saw myself from God's standpoint, at that time my theology wasn't very good. And I thought that when God saw what a hypocrite I was, that I thought he was going to kill me. I honestly did. And I know... Most people think that that's an exaggeration, but my dad died when I was 12 years old. I was told that it was God's will that he died, that God took him. And so I was under the impression that God killed people and the wrath and the judgment of God was on people. And when I saw how ungodly I was, I honestly thought God was going to kill me. And for the next hour and a half in front of the pastor of the church, the youth director, all of my friends, I turned myself inside out, repenting of every sin I had ever done or had ever thought about doing. And you've got to remember that I hadn't gone out and outwardly done the things that most people had done. But, you know, Jesus said, if you've thought about it in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. If you've hated a person, you're guilty of murder. And so I started confessing the thoughts that I'd had and naming names. And whatever reputation I had, I blew it. I killed it. I mean, I turned myself inside out just hoping that if God was to uh, show up that, you know, at least I'd go to heaven instead of going to hell. And so after an hour and a half of repenting of everything I'd ever done or ever would do, I was just laying there in a puddle of tears waiting to see what God's response would be. And to my surprise, instead of rejection and punishment, I had a supernatural love come over me. And I don't have the words to describe it. But for four and a half months, I was just gone someplace. I was enveloped in the love of God. I never ate a meal. I mean, I ate, but I'd never sit down and eat because I was so excited. I just could not stand it. I never slept more than an hour at a time for four and a half months. I was literally caught up in the presence of the Lord. And it overwhelmed me. And you would think that that means everything be, we'd live happily forever after. It was actually just the opposite because after experiencing the love of God in a tangible way like that, after four and a half months, that left. And I, I got a lot of teaching. I was just telling Jane this morning, I, last night I was holding a Bible study and one of the people that worked for me, they had figured out that on our website we have enough teaching that you could listen to my teachings free for 24 hours a day for 12 years. That's how much teaching we have on our website free of charge. So I've got a lot to say about stuff. But anyway, um, uh, I could tell you why this happened. But after four and a half months, the feeling left and then absolute panic and desperation set in. Because I didn't know what I did to cause God to love me like this. I didn't know what I did to cause the feeling to leave. I didn't know what I had to do to get it back. But I was ruined. I could never go back to being normal. And uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me, I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, it was really a blessing because I was just on a fire support base sitting by myself for 13 months in a bunker that I built 
and I had nothing to do, and um, out of desperation, I just stuck my nose in the Bible and started reading up to 10, 15 hours a day, and it revolutionized my life. And the love that I had felt just by feelings, I began to start seeing it through the Word of God. And it literally transformed my life. And I mean, the Word of God has just um, revolutionized me. You know, I was telling Jane, and again, I'm saying these things to glorify the Lord, not myself, but because of the Word of God working in me, uh, you know, this whole thing with the coronavirus, I've seen my son raised from the dead after being dead for five hours. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. And, after, and you know, we probably have over 50 people in our ministry that have seen people raised from the dead. And it's a regular occurrence. We see blind eyes open, deaf ears open. The Word of God has just transformed us. And after experiencing things like that, you know, a little virus is no big deal. It changes your perspective. And so the Word of God just literally came alive on the inside of me, and uh, it just transformed my life. And so the Lord has called me to be a teacher of the Word, and this is what I do, and He's blessed me. I started on radio in 1976, and we went on about 150 radio stations. And then in 2000, January the 3rd, 2000, if any of you remember the Y2K thing that was going around, uh, we started our television ministry on January the 3rd, the first Monday after Y2K. And so we've been on for 20 years, and we now uh, cover 3.2 billion people on the planet and uh, are just seeing great things happen. And then in, uh, I think it was 94, the Lord spoke to me about starting the Karis Bible College. And we now have our main campus up here in Woodland Park have around 800 students up there, but we have 70 campuses worldwide and over eight or 9,000 people involved in the whole uh, system. And God's just touching people's lives and doing some great things. So that is a quick overview of what God's done in my life. But I want to amplify on just a couple of things here. And the thing that really turned my life around, like I said, I had this experience, but you can't live off of an experience. The truth, the revelation from God that changed my life came to me uh, when I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And that scripture says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself by his son, Jesus Christ. And I was reading that, and I was just thinking, Father, there, I'm not new. I said, I know that you love me. I have experienced your love. I know that I'm saved. If I was to die, I would go to heaven. I said, I know all of that, but you said that all things would become new. And I'd heard people say before that all things are in the process of becoming new. But as I read it and I went into the Greek and studied it, that's not what it says. It's not saying that you're in the process of becoming new, that we're all becoming more like Christ gradually. It said that if any man's in Christ, he is a new creature. He's not going to be. He is already. Old things have passed away. And there were things in my life that hadn't passed away. There were all kinds of fears, and I was still an introvert. And I still had all of these things going, and I, and I just saw what the Word said, and I was looking at myself, and they didn't match. And I was asking God for a revelation on this, and this is what changed my life. There's a scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where he's praying a prayer, and he says, I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I read that, I thought, I, I only recognize two parts of me, this physical body that we're all aware of and that we see our physical body. And then I knew that there was an inner person, your feelings and your emotions. But functionally, that's all I realized that there was to me, was just the, the physical body and then this mental, emotional part. But the scripture made it very clear that there was a spirit, soul, and body. And I got to ask him what the difference was, and I'll give you the condensed version on this. But the Lord showed me that there is a third part of us, the spirit man. It's different than the soul. Most people use the word spirit and soul interchangeably, but the Bible doesn't. And it was in the spirit 
that we get changed when we make Jesus our Savior and we receive salvation. And according to 2 Corinthians 5.17, when you get born again, that spirit is completely new. It is not in the process of becoming new. It's not born again a little Christian, and it's got to grow. Again, these are some of the misconceptions that I had, and I found out that most people have, that they think that when you get saved, you only have a little seed of Jesus. It's like a baby. They have all five fingers, uh, you know, ten fingers total, ten toes. They're all there, but they're all immature, and they've got to grow. And most people see themselves being born again as a baby and having to grow. Well, the Bible does talk about growth, but it's not in your spirit. Your spirit is born again complete. You are identical to Jesus in your spirit. It's your soul that is gaining understanding and that is growing. There is a growth, but it's your soul, mental, emotional part. But in the spirit, your spirit is as perfect the moment you get born again as it will ever be in eternity. I'm saying a lot of things that I hadn't got time to verify. If you were to go get some of my teaching, I can tag a scripture to every single thing I'm saying. For instance, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may be, uh, have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. It didn't say, so are we going to be in the next world, but so are we in this world. That was another scripture that I looked at and I thought, how in the world do you understand this? Because I believe Jesus is perfect. I believe he's complete. I don't believe Jesus is worried about the coronavirus. Matter of fact, I just shared with my staff, we have about, I think it's 542 staff that are here in Colorado, but then we have another hundred and something that are scattered around the world. And I just shared with them on Monday about Jesus and how he's not scared about this coronavirus. And we put up a picture. I've got it here on my phone. Uh, but we got a picture of a guy who looks like Jesus and he's praying for somebody and he's got a mask on. You know, that just doesn't seem to fit. I don't think that Jesus is afraid of the coronavirus. I don't believe that he's afraid of getting sick. And as he is, that's the way that you are. And yet some of you might think, but you know, I have fear. Well, that's in your physical body. It's in your soulish realm, your mental, emotional part. But in your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are you right this moment. One third of you is complete. If you're born again, if you've made Jesus your Lord, you are as changed as you will ever be. And the rest of the Christian life is what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That word conform there means to pour into the mold. Man, that is a strong statement. And brothers and sisters, I think that the vast majority of us are more poured into the mold of this world than what God wants us to be. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word transform there is the Greek word metamorpho. It's the word we get metamorphosis from. And in the same way that a caterpillar spins a cocoon and then comes out a butterfly, if you want to see change in your life like that, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. The way you get changed is through the renewing of your mind. Your spirit is already changed. I'm pointing here to my belly because John chapter 7, Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit. So looks like some of us have more of the spirit than others. <laughs> but I'm, we have Christ in us. And in your born again spirit, you are complete. You are identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word for one there is hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. It's not like here's God and here we are down here and we're parallel, we're similar. No, we are identical. In the spirit realm, if there could be 
uh, things such as atoms and molecules. You are atom for atom, molecule for molecule, identical to Jesus in your spirit. And again, it's not that you have a tiny bit of Jesus. You have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. John chapter 1, verse 16. As he is, so are we in this world. Jesus is not immature sitting at the Father's right hand. He's in all of his glory. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the, the, we have been uh, called to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your spirit is as perfect and as complete and pure right this moment as it will ever be in eternity. Now see, this is what God began to reveal to me as I was sitting in Vietnam just reading the, the Bible. I began to see that all of my lacks and inadequacy, my lack of education, my, you know, I'm a hick from Texas, and I have people make fun of me all of the time. I was just talking to John Tesh yesterday, and some of you know John Tesh, and he's become a friend of mine, and he, he stood up at one of my meetings, and he says, I thought that you were trying to imitate Gomer Pyle. And I have people make fun of me. Again, if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I've got all of these things in the natural that aren't good, but in the spirit, I'm awesome. And I have learned how to start living from who I am in Christ. It's enabled me to overcome being an introvert. It's enabled me to stand and speak in front of millions of people and to do things. And it's all because in the Spirit, we are brand new creatures. And yet most of us have an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. We approach things like this coronavirus as just a mere human being. I am a human being, but I am not only a human being. You know, Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, for without me, you can do nothing. And I agree with that 100%. Without Jesus, I am a zero with the rim knocked off. I'm nothing. I believe that, but I'm never without Jesus. In my spirit, I have the same power that lives on the inside of me that lives in Jesus. And because of that, like I was sharing, I've been able to see my son raised from the dead. He was dead for nearly five hours, between four and five hours. He was already in a morgue. They'd stripped him naked. They'd put him in a cooler. And they called me and my wife and I just agreed. And my son, after being dead for nearly five hours, sat up and started talking. And, and uh, today, I mean, he is uh, as normal as he ever was. He wasn't ever normal. But he, he, uh, Eileen here knows him. He works for me. And he's a brilliant guy. And it's amazing what God has done. And he had a daughter that was born one year after he was raised from the dead. There's not very many people that can say that they were born a year after their father died. <laughs> she has uh, quite an honor, and she just lives a mile or two from here. They live real close to here. But anyway, I've been able to see things like this happen, and it's not because of anything special about me. It's because of who I am in Christ, and I found out that if I can, if I can believe that I have this power, that it's not out there so somewhere. See, this is what my problem was. I believe that God was awesome. I never have discredited God. I've never felt angry or bitter at God. I felt like God could do anything he wanted to. But it was like, am I worthy of it? Am I good enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I studied enough? And those were the things that were stopping God's power from operating in my life. But when I found out that I already had it, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, 18 and 19, prays that our eyes would be open to see what we already have. And it says it's the same power that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. I have the same resurrection power on the inside of me that Jesus has in him because I have Jesus in me. And I know some people take what I'm saying and think, so you just think that you're special or you're, you're better than everybody else. I don't think anything special about me, but I think that Jesus lives on the inside of me. And he said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. Jesus is living in me, and he lives in every one of us that have been born again. And if you would just receive it, you can let him live through you, and miracles can happen. 
We typically see miracles all the time. It's not unusual to see blind eyes open, deaf ears open, people come out of wheelchairs on a regular basis. And it's not because I'm a healer. I don't have a healing ministry. What I do is tell people what who Jesus is. And, and the testimonies that I like the most are the ones that I never even pray for the people. I tell them who they are and what God has done on the inside of them. And they just believe. And we have been seeing awesome, awesome miracles. You know, I encourage you on our website, it's it's free. 99% of everything on our website is free, awmi.net. And we've got 40 testimonies of people that have been raised from the dead, people that have come out of wheelchairs, and great miracles happen. we got one lady that's in Hollywood. Her husband is a, a Grammy award-winning producer out there, and she had spent over $300,000 on medications trying to cope, and she couldn't even get out of the house. And she got to watching me on television, and it changed her life. And uh, anyway, uh, Julianne Hartman is her name, and she never had me pray for her. She just got hold of the truth, started walking through her house, and this woman is totally healed, and now she has healing services and prays with people, and they go in and minister to all of these famous people in Hollywood and stuff, and they are just making a tremendous impact. And those are the ones that I love the most is to see the people find out who you are. One of the problems in the body of Christ is we have admitted that, yes, there are some people who just like have something special from God. And so we put them on a pedestal. And we have those people. And everybody goes to their meetings and has them pray for them. And God does anoint certain people with special things. I believe the reason he does it is because if the only way for you to receive from God a healing or whether it's prosperity, joy, peace, or anything, if the only way for you to receive was just to find out who you are and exercise your faith and believe, and well, there's a growth process in that. And if a person came today who only had a week to live and they had a year's worth of growing to do before they could get to the place where they could receive from God, well, then they'd just be destined to die. And so because of that, God has certain people that have special gifts, and you can go and get healed off of somebody else's gift. And so that does happen, but it was never meant to be a substitute for every one of us knowing who we are. It's just a temporary stopgap measure to help us as you're growing and maturing. But what really blesses me, what God's called me to do, is to be a teacher and to share with people who they are and what they have. Every one of you, if you were born again, if you've made Jesus your Lord, you have the same power living on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I can guarantee you that's enough for your headache, for your cold, for your coronavirus, for anything else. And if you could believe it, it just sets you free. You live in a different place. Not because you're different, not because your physical body or your mind, it's because of who's inside of you. And somebody says, well, I'm not sure. I, I know I'm a Christian, but I'm not sure I have that power. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you are born again, you do have Jesus living on the inside of you. And he didn't just come in with one finger or one toe he is either living in you, the fullness of the Godhead indwells you, or he doesn't. And if he's there, the only thing that stops it from coming out is your unrenewed mind. If you could imagine right now that like there was a pipe or something over my head, and over here on this side, this is your physical body, but over here is your spirit. And in the spirit, you got the fullness of God over here. You don't lack anything. You've got resurrection power. The Bible says, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. In the spirit realm, you're perfect. You're as perfect right this moment as you'll ever be in eternity. Your spirit's not going to be changed. It's already saved. One-third of your salvation is over. So in the spirit realm, everything's perfect. But for it to get out into the physical body over here, it's got to flow through your mind. Your mind is like a valve. Just as you can put a valve in a pipe and you can close that valve 
and none of the life that's over here will flow through because your valve is closed. Or you can only open it a portion and you can have just a little bit of it come through. But as you renew your mind, if you get to where you start walking in the Spirit and dealing with everything, the coronavirus, your physical healing, your finances, your relationships, everything, when you deal with it based on who you are in Christ, that is renewing your mind. That's opening up this valve. And it will allow the life that's in your spirit to flow out into your physical body. And it's really that simple. You get transformed. You get that valve open by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And so that's what my whole life's been about. That's what my whole ministry is about. And I'm telling you, God has great things for every one of you. God doesn't want us to be living sick. You know, I was visiting with Jane and prayed with her this morning. And, and she was saying, I know God can heal. And I said, not only can, He, he has. He wants you healed. Jesus wants you to be healed as much as he wants you to be forgiven of sins. Jesus would no more want you to have sickness in your body than he would want you to go commit adultery. Now, he loves you regardless of what's going on, but he died for the healing of your body just as much as he died for the forgiveness of your sins. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Who is on self? Uh, man, I just went blank on that one. 1 Peter 2.24 Whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. It puts forgiveness of sins and healing of the body in the exact same verse and it puts it in the past tense. Jesus has already healed you. You've got healing right here. In your spirit, it's just got to get through this brain. It's got you got to remove this valve. You've got to open it up and recognize that you've already got raising from the dead power on the inside of you, and it's just a matter of receiving what you already have. It's not out there. You don't have to pray down the power of God. This is what so many churches are doing. They're up there in the heavenlies binding this, and they'll make statements like, "Well, that prayer didn't get above the ceiling." You don't need your prayer to get above your nose. Because God, right here, this is the reason you bow your head when you pray. So you can say, Father, amen. This whole concept that God's way out there and that somehow or another, God, would you stretch forth your hand? Would you heal? Would you touch this person? It's all wrong. If you are born again, you are the mobile office of Jesus. He lives on the inside of you. And it says in Matthew chapter 10, he didn't tell you to go pray for the sick. He said, go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Matthew 10, 8. Do you know, if you just pray and say, oh, Father, we are nothing, we have nothing, we can do nothing, but we know that you can do all things. Would you stretch forth your hand and touch this person if it be your will? You're going to die praying that. Jesus has done everything about healing that he's going to do. It's not up to Jesus to heal you. He's put this power on the inside of you, and you have to release it. Jesus said this in Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Notice, there's some important things. He said, whoever will say unto this mountain. Most people talk to God about their mountain. Oh God, I've got cancer. Oh God, would you please do something? That's not what he told you to do. He told you to speak to the mountain. Implied in there is it, it didn't say anything about asking God. God is already healed. By his stripes we were healed. Now you have to believe and take your authority and speak to the problem. You know, I mentioned John Tesh. He's a friend of mine, and he had cancer five years ago, and they told him he had less than six months to live. And that's when he found me on uh, television. Somebody gave him one of my teachings, and anyway, we became friends. And at that time, he, he was just not to a place to where he could just believe for supernatural healing and so he went through uh, prostate surgery he went through chemotherapy and had all of these things and uh, 
and he just believed God to bless him. And anyway, he got over it. Well, a couple of years later, it came back. And so they, he went, and they wanted to do surgery again, and they wanted to do what he calls carpet bombing on his pelvis. He said it would have made him sterile. It would have affected his bowels. It would have affected everything. And by this time, he had grown enough that he says, man, the, I don't want this. And he just stood and believed God. And it's now been two years. He is absolutely, totally, completely uh, healed. Matter of fact, he did a concert at our place up here in Woodland Park that's be being aired right now on PBS. And he's telling everybody about the healing of his cancer supernaturally by the power of God. But that scripture from Mark eleven twenty three 23 is what changed him because he realized he had the authority. He had been asking God to heal him. He had been begging God to heal him. And he said now he realized he had this power in him and he was taking his authority and instead he spoke to sickness. And because of it, he's been miraculously healed. You know, I need to quit. I'm sorry. I don't. They didn't tell me when to quit, but I'll quit with this. I had a woman come to me in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this woman had a uh, disease that uh, I don't know what it was, but anyway, they said on a scale of 1 to 10, her pain was a constant 11. And the way that she had existed for seven years, she sewed magnets into a blanket and then she taped magnets all over her body and she wrapped herself in this blanket and somehow or another these electrical fields between the magnets lessened her pain. And that's the way that she lived and she was housebound and she had been this way for seven years. So a friend invited her over to the house I sat down and prayed with her, and she, she started off by saying, I know God has a purpose in giving me this sickness. And I said, God did not give you this sickness. God does not put sickness on you, and I had to counter that. And I had to minister to her a number of things, and I, I ministered to her for 10, 20 minutes, and then I prayed for her, and I commanded this pain. She had this constant pain. I commanded this pain to leave. And uh, I said, now, how do you feel? So she stood up, and she took this blanket off, and she says, I don't have any pain. It was the first time in seven years that she had been pain free. But then she said, but I've got this burning right here at my waist in the back. Why didn't the burning leave? And I said, you didn't tell me that you had burning. I didn't talk to burning. I talked to pain. So I said, watch this. And then I commanded and commanded burning to leave her. And I said, how do you feel? And she says, well, man, I feel great. So I spent 20 minutes teaching her from Mark 11, 23, and 24 about you speaking to the problem. Not talking to God about the problem, but you believing God gave you authority and you speak to your problem. And I said, if, if you ever have another pain or anything come back, it doesn't mean that you weren't healed. It means that it's the devil knocking at the door and seeing if you're going to respond. He knows I believe what I'm saying. He's not sure you believe. And so if you have a pain, it doesn't mean you lost it. It doesn't mean that it's uh, come back. It just It's the devil seeing if you'll let him in. And so you speak to him. So I told her all of these things. As she was getting ready to leave, I remember she just put her hand on the doorknob and she froze. And she stood there for a second. And then she looked back over her shoulder and she says, the burning is back. And I said, well, I've been teaching you what to do if you ever have any of these symptoms come back. So I said, instead of me praying for you, I want you to pray. So I joined hands with her, and I said, you pray. And this woman, this is nearly word for word what she said. She says, Father, I thank you that you did not give me this. This is not from you. This is an attack of the enemy. I claim my healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I am healed. And when she got through, I said, so do you still have the burning? And she said, yes. And I said, you know why? And she said, no. And I said, you didn't pray well. Most people would think that's a great prayer. And it is, it's good things that she said. They were all good things, but it is not what the Lord told you to do. He told you to speak to the problem, not to talk to him about the problem, but you to take your authority and speak to the problem. And I said, you didn't talk to that burning. And she says, you mean I'm supposed to say burning and talk to it like it's a person? I said, yes. She says, I'll do it. So anyway, we prayed again, and this time she said, burning in the name of Jesus. She got mad, and she said, burning in the name of Jesus. And that's as far as she got. She says, it's gone. And that's been 15, 20 years ago. 
And as far as I know, it's never come back. I'd seen her two or three years after that. She never had another problem. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you have this supernatural raising from the dead power. Coronavirus is nothing. It is nothing. Cancer is nothing. Nothing is as big as what God is on the inside of you. But the problem is this brain. We haven't renewed it. We are conformed to the way the world thinks. We think we're only human. I'm not only human. One third of me is wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. I am born again. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. But I'm never without Jesus. And because of it, it has transformed my life. And I just want to share these things with you. And praise God, the Lord would love to do the exact same things in your life. He is no respecter of persons. And now, you know, I used to pray with people till 2 and 3 o'clock in the mornings after my meetings. I'd pray with hundreds and hundreds of people every time I ministered. Now I travel with our Bible college students, and I'll have 50 of them standing in front of me, and I let them do all the praying. I don't even pray for that many people anymore. And you know what? I love it because we are seeing more miracles happen now through other people than I ever saw happen through me. This is not something that is reserved for just a few people. This is for every Joe Blow and Jane Doe Christian in the body of Christ. The Bible says believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, not just ministers, not just people with the gift of healing. Every one of you can believe and receive this. And so that's my testimony, and I'm sticking with it. Praise God. I praise God for what he's done in my life. Can I just pray for you real quickly? Does anybody in here have any physical problems that you would like prayer for? I'm not going to pray for you individually. I'll pray for us as a group. Anybody? I see one hand back here. Anybody else? Here's some more. You know, if you're going to receive this, just stand where you are and let me pray for you. And again, I'm not going to take the time to minister to each one of you individually, but if you could receive what I was talking about, you already have this supernatural power of God on the inside of you. And all you got to do is just believe and release it. Amen. And it'll work for any one of you. So, Father, right now, we thank you for what Jesus did for us. We thank you that Jesus overcame all sickness and all disease. You said you would bless our bread and water and take away sickness from the midst of us. That we don't ever have to be sick. Never. Father, we thank you that that supernatural healing power indwells us. And so right now, we just release it. We receive it. I release the power of God. I speak against all of these physical things, all of this sickness, all of these diseases. Somebody's hip is being healed right now. Somebody has had uh, like bone on bone, your hip. I command that pain to be gone. And Father, I just release right now healing power through this hip that they'll be able to walk with no problems. Father, we just receive right now. We speak whatever it is that's your problem. Speak to it. Talk to it. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. We command hearts to be healed right now. We command arthritis to be gone in the name of Jesus. We command all kinds of of blood problems uh, to be healed. Arteries to be healed. Brain tumors. Eyes. Teeth, Father, whatever it is, we just speak to these parts of our body and we thank you that you've already done your part now. We release it. We speak healing to these bodies in Jesus' name. Somebody's feet are being healed right now that's had chronic problems in your feet. Right now, in the name of Jesus, pain you leave, diseases you leave. We we also release, Father, your power to surround us to be a shield round about us, that no plague comes nigh our dwelling, that if any germ touches us, it has to die. Father, we thank you that we are not just reactive, we are proactive. We release your supernatural power, and we thank you, Father, that your power surrounds us, goes before us, follows after us, and that we walk in the supernatural power of God. And Father, we just thank you right now. I believe that every person who's standing, whatever it is that they need, 
We believe that your power indwells us and that it is flowing through us and that we're going to walk out of this place different. We walk out of this place healed and healthy. And we thank you for that and agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I believe God touched some people's lives. So thanks for letting me come. God bless you.